Good afternoon. Welcome to the the March 18th, 2024 Board of Education meeting. We've got a packed house tonight. Um, the first order of business is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. The next thing is to approve the minutes. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, board members got a big crowd and looking forward to it. Celebrating a lot of good accomplishments. We have three uh, cheerleading teams here today, and uh, these outstanding athletes have done a lot in the last few months, really since about June, I guess, when you started practicing in earnest and you've earned some big time accomplishments. So we'll recognize them first. So I'm going to start with uh, our Liberty Park Middle School cheerleaders who I believe are here. So you guys all come to the front. Mm -hmm. There they are. Pull it to the side, right to the middle. <laughs> so, Liberty Park Middle School cheerleading squad, they have been competing all year long. They are the state champions. <laughs> Offer some comments about your team. These girls have worked so hard, and when they started last spring, they had one coach, and they suddenly lost their coach over the summer, and they had to change on a dime, and they completely rose to the occasion, um, enlisted trust in a whole new team. They worked together and they achieved one of their major goals, which was to win state. We couldn't be more proud of them. Okay, so you start us off, introduce yourself, mm -hmm. coaches do that, and then ladies come all the way down the line and tell us who you are, okay? Okay. I'm Mary Beth Ely and I'm the assistant coach. I'm Lisa Williams and I'm the new head coach. Mm -hmm. I'm Kate Lee, and I'm one of the assistant coaches. I'm Olivia Haskin. I'm Reese Freeland. I'm McKenna Bernal. I'm Harper Judd. I'm Hannah Ward. I'm Mary Morgan Rogers. I'm Macy Davis. I'm Amelia Cranfield. I'm Campbell Horn. I'm Lily Kate Morland. I'm Sophie Dynon. I'm Evie Skates. Bella Kate Morlito. I'm Kanisha Patel. I'm Megan Mary. I'm Emma Taff. And I'm Linda Chandler. All right, middle school state champions. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you. So, our JV squad has been competing as well, and they recently finished up. They were named state champions, which is a really big accomplishment. However, they took it one step further about a month ago. Uh, were named national champions uh, in, in their JV competition group. So, congratulations, state national. Over here to my right and your left. So, hey, Coach Brown. Hey, 
you want to start us off, give some comments, and then you guys introduce yourself. Absolutely, yes. Uh, my name is Leslie Coleman. Got married in the summer. Um, and then we have our JV coaches, uh, Shelly Sumner and Maddie Sullivan. Um, these ladies did such a great job this year. They conquered all of the in-state and out-of-state uh, competitions. We got first in all of our performances this year. And I'm so, so proud to be the head coach here at Vestavia and so proud of this uh, JV team and these uh, coaches. So I'll just let them say their name and, and we'll just give them a round of applause. <laughs> yes. Hey, Shatter. Haley Banta. Hannah Grace Johnston. Caroline Powell. Maggie Denny. Mallory Jones. Samantha Scrabo. Lily Armstrong. Kate Darkcraft. Avery Vickers. Catherine Massinger. Hyper Lucson. Paige Cryer. Addison Peters. Sam McDuncan. Baker Martin. Cameron Tate. Campbell Vassier. <laughs> Carolyn Malberg. Grace Ann Swift. Courtney Martin. Jimmy <laughs> Bailey. Cece Ferguson. Elise Ball. Bradford Williams. Grace Brown. <laughs> Let's bring all our bars in. Okay, well, uh, this is our varsity cheerleading squad, and they've been working for a long time as well. I guess the trials in uh, last spring, and uh, I would tell you that. My knowledge of what they do is very limited, but you recognize incredible athleticism when you see it, and they really are. They go to these incredible athletes and work so hard and really are just the support, and a lot of times in a uh, way that's not seen, but when they get the floor and get to compete the way they do, it's quite remarkable to see that, and it's like going into a NCAA basketball tournament. It's very exciting. So recently, back in the fall, they were named state champions in Alabama and varsity cheerleading. So congratulations. Team. Um, this is the first time since uh, 2017 that varsity has won state. Um, this is also the first time that we have placed first in all of our competitions as well, in state and out of state. And this is also the first time since 2015 that our varsity team went straight to finals down at nationals. Um, it didn't come out to the way we wanted it to be. We got eighth place at nationals, but these girls did a phenomenal job. I am so, so proud of these ladies and their hard work. I, like us, like. Dr. Freeman said it's more than just quick shaking pom poms and wearing a cheerleading skirt and chilling outfit on Friday night trip. It's that you don't, unfortunately, you don't get to see all the things that we do, but maybe this upcoming year you can come to some of our friends and families that we host in um, the new and old gyms um, during the fall so you can actually see this competition hard work too. Um, and then I'll let you say their names, but I also want to give a big round of applause and recognition to my captains. We definitely couldn't have done it without them. Mallory Four, Brenda Martin, and Kennedy Vincent. I'm Kelly Johnson, Campbell Moore, Macy Rutherford, Riley Shadrick, Meredith Bachman, Case Huntley, Rebecca Evans, Julian Bachman, Elizabeth Broder, Wayne Stafferton, Lily Vincent, Brennan Norton, Mallory Ford, Campbell Sparks, Lickley Williams, Emma Trailer, Eliza Thornton, Ella Hahn, Lauren Christian, Phoebe Hill, Emily Appleby, and Allison Crawford. Just to echo what Dr. Spring said, uh, my daughter is in the cheer program. 
more or less committed that I would not embarrass her by calling her out. Um, but these girls at all levels work extremely hard, not just the hours at school, certainly not just the hours on the uh, track cheering, but lots of out-of-school commitment uh, and the athleticism is just remarkable and impressive. So I'm very proud of them. And, and it's really inspiring to see how hard they work to, to do as well as they've done. It is, and you recognize as a parent, Jacqueline does, and I go through as well, how probably one day will. Uh, I have a wife that I was a part of our process when we were in Auburn, and it, it is quite remarkable what they do, the time and effort they put in. They really are spirit athletes, so appreciate you share it. Okay, well, surprise may be out of the bag just a little bit here, uh, but we have a, a recognition that we wanted to give tonight to just a dear friend in our school system. A lot of folks are here to to praise that dear friend. I'm gonna let the video run, and then we're just gonna brag on Mr. Pat Boone a little bit tonight. Okay. <laughs> just can't begin to tell you how much uh, Pat Boone means to this city and to our school system. Pat Boone was a city council member from 1972 to 1976. He was re-elected into that role and was serving his second term as a city council member when his predecessor, Bob Vance, moved on to the federal bench Pat took the position as city attorney and as the school's attorney. So since that time, and I'm, I'm thinking it's about 47 years, Pat has represented the city and the schools and just done an outstanding job. Just can't say enough good about him. And uh, I congratulate Pat Boone and thank you to the school system for recognizing this gentleman. Um, he's a real gym investor. I've known Pat and Nancy Boone for probably 25 to 30 years. First met them just being involved in the city and uh, quickly grew to love and respect Pat. He is a walking encyclopedia. If you ever want to know anything about Vestavia Hills, he's the go-to person. In fact, I call him the Hope Diamond of Vestavia Hills. Pat is a, a, a wonderful asset to our city. I don't know what we'll do when he's gone because he has knowledge that nobody else has. Pat um, and Nancy, y'all have been some of my biggest heroes and I'm a better person for having known you. Pat is also one of the best family men I have ever seen. Him and his wife, Nancy, raised two kids in Vestavia, and even his daughter taught at Vestavia. And here's a man that has not only served the Vestavia Board of Education, but he's been helping the uh, City Hall for 40 years, being their attorney also. So here's a man that's probably, in my mind, underpaid and overworked and i mean that he is uh he is just a total blessing to this whole uh, whole community of that stadium we will miss him one day if he ever leaves because when you spend this long a time in this city serving the city and the schools i tell you what he to me he may have made the biggest impact because of longevity that he's had in this community and as I know he's an Auburn man, and uh, I'm an Alabama man, but I'm going to tell you what, I do not have a better friend than Pat Boone. All right, so when I joined the State Board of Education, I was told something that turned out to be very true. I was told the first year is the best year. You might think, why is the first year the best year? It's like you're learning, you're trying to figure out how did you get put on this thing, what is your role here? But the first year of being on the State Board of Education is the best year because you get to sit next to Mr. Boone. And then you learn so much from sitting next to Mr. Boone. There's a thing in philosophy called Chesterton's Fence. 
And it's this concept that when you come up upon a fence, somebody at some point spent the money, spent the time, spent the effort, the energy to build a fence. And lots of times, I think our tendency is to come along and want to like rip down these fences and take them away. And this is not an anti-improvement thing. It's just the sense that there was a reason at some point if you didn't understand what those reasons are. Maybe that fence was to protect you from a raging bull in the field over or something like that. Maybe it was for your own good, or maybe it doesn't serve its purpose anymore. But let me tell you, if you sit next to Mr. Boone, you know all the reasons for all the things. He has such a vast encyclopedic knowledge of Estavia, it's really remarkable. But the most important thing is Mr. Boone cares about the students, right, is that he has family members that work in the school system, his kids went to the school system, and he is so deeply invested in the school system. So we were looking to make decisions. We knew that we were going to get the right legal um, recommendation for Mr. Boone, but we knew that it was also going to be what is best for our students. And he always wanted to keep that top of mind. So we're making all these moves, all these changes, it was always with what is best for the students in mind. And you just can't put a price tag on his care and compassion for both the city of Estavia, the school system, and then ultimately the students and the people who work in this great school system. If there was an election in Vestavia Hills um, for Mr. Vestavia Hills, <laughs> it would be without a doubt Pat Burn. He's grown up in Vestavia, he has served Vestavia on uh, the attorney for the city council, the attorney for the board of education, and he's done this for many years without any fanfare. If you congratulate Pat on anything, he will tell you it was a team effort. Pat's not looking for publicity. Uh, he's been city attorney. He's been attorney for the board of education. He's just been a best agent most of his life, all of his adult life. Such a good guy, such a quality guy, well-educated guy, and most importantly, he is a great resident of the city of West Davis Hills. Well, Pat, I don't know anybody who has done more for this city and served it longer and with more dedication than you. When you came on the city council, the city was broke. The Board of Education was broke. That's because they had invested everything in getting the school system started. And we needed a second elementary school, but we just there was no way to begin to explore that. However, when you all were offering that referendum, the school board decided to ask for an additional two and a quarter tax for school purposes to build an elementary school. And we, you know, we had the perfect place to build it. And when the Wall Sisters sold the property, they placed a restriction on a portion of it. No city uh, maintenance departments, no schooling. But you remember, and I love this, Pat, how one Sunday afternoon you decided that you were going to make one last gasping effort and you were going to talk with them. I know that they were charmed from the moment they opened that door and saw you standing there with that winning smile on your face and how you told them that you had come to tell them about what was going on in the city because you knew they were interested. And how your little wife and her garden club got together and how they went out knocking on doors, businesses and residential, asking for help, physical and monetary, and got the money together and all the people and they built this beautiful, wonderful little kitty park. And Miss Mildred and Miss Edna, we need your help so much. We really need to build a school in that park. We don't have anywhere else to place one. When they say to you, we will, Mr. Boone. <laughs> and I remember your answer when I said, Pat, why do you think they changed their mind like that? He said, well, nobody had bothered to come and really explain things to them and tell them what was going on. And they were always interested in knowing there's so many things that you've done through all the years that none of us know about. But you have been there helping, encouraging, supporting. I just can't thank you enough for knowing you, for, for what you've done and the privilege of knowing you.
Not yet. Not yet. Uh, we, uh, first of all, what we need to be is to break behind that public relations campaign right there. And that was fantastic video work. And uh, we had a lot of superstars in Best Davy that wanted to be a part of it. And so I appreciate that. The brain uh, child of this idea was our board president and several months ago said, let's make something happen uh, to honor Pat Boone. And so I want to really pivot to her and then uh, other members of the board. And then uh, I, at some point, Pat, I want you to introduce these fine and uh, uh, beautiful family members you got with you today. Okay. Uh, well, I just said there's no one that deserves to be honored more than Pat Boone. And I can't believe it took this long to do it. But one of the greatest honors of my life has been to serve the board and get to become a friend of Mr. Boone. And what I love the most is, like, he just transcends all age groups. He's just a friend to everybody. Whether you're a prince or a pauper, he treats everyone the same. Um, He's just touched my life in more ways than I can tell you. He's just such a gift to our community. I thank your family for giving him to us because he's had to devote so much time to our system. And I know the city and behind every good man is a very strong woman. And we know you're a part of that as well. But I mean, he is a true gift and a friend and we're just so grateful for him and the legacy he leaves is um, going to be something special for everybody to, to follow. And he's going to be big shoes one day. We need to keep him around as long as possible, keep him healthy, playing golf and having fun and, and living his life. But he's just such a gift. And we just wanted to honor you today and let you know how amazing you are. Thank you, Jacqueline, board members and friends and family. I would just echo everything Jacqueline said uh, and emphasize that we have no plans for Pat to be doing anything other than exactly what he's doing for a long, long time. But I will say as an attorney, I've been so impressed by your skill and your advocacy, but more importantly as a client, I could not be more pleased than, than, uh, to have you represent us in our interest. And as David Powell said, we always know you're coming at that representation based on what you believe is in the best interest of our students, which is obviously ours as well. And I want to thank you for, for that. Thank you. Uh, the all-star of a cast that was presented in the video, and uh, what Scott Jackman said, that it's hard to put add anything to it. But it, to, to sum it up, uh, I've grown up in Vestavia all my life. My dad grew up in Vestavia all his life and was fortunate enough to um, know Mr. Boone growing up. And so what I what I really take to, to heart is a lot of the stories Dad has told me. I've gotten to run by Mr. Boone, and he's kind of uh, qualified him a little bit. <laughs> the fish aren't as big necessarily, but uh, it's just the Boone. What an awesome family! And I've grown up with all of you all. Julie babysat me when I was a little kid. Uh, it's just, it's. I think the one word: you're truly a treasure, and um, never, never really found a treasure. But if, if I found one, you, you would be there because you, to this community, um, that's what you are. And uh, I hope that uh, our treasure of gold continues to, to serve here for, for as long as you want and for many more years because just the resource and the wisdom you provide is, is second to none. And we thank you very much. Thank you, I'll test what David said in that video is the newest person on this board. I knew walking into the first, I think, training meeting when I sat down with you and got just a load of answers to questions. I knew that you were a treasure trove of information. So I appreciate that. Okay. I am honored and I'm humble. I want to thank my wonderful family first 
And they're all here tonight. At the far end of the aisle is my son, Patrick Jr., his daughter, Hannah, and little great-grandson, Ryder Boone. And then we have Howie, who's a sophomore at Auburn, Julie, my daughter, who was a high school English teacher, my lovely wife, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Gail Pickard, who's been with me as my legal assistant for 47 years and never had another job. My grandson, Pat Latham, senior at Auburn. His twin brother, Sam Latham, also a twin uh, senior at Auburn, going to graduate in May. It's I that should be thanking you, and here's why. Decades of people have allowed me to be on this team. And I never will forget, I was quite a young lawyer and someone asked me to represent them before our city council and I did. And I came home that night and I asked Nancy, I said, Nancy, sweetheart, you better buy a new dress. <laughs> she said, what are you talking about? Buy a new dress. I said, I'm going to run for city council and you need to have a new dress. She said, sit down, boy, let me take your temperature. <laughs> and I served on the city council for one full term and a partial term. And I had been practicing law for about 10 years at that time. This city, and I love to tell the story, and I wish that Robert S. Vance were here to tell, hear me tell this story because I love to tell it. Bob Vance was the very best lawyer that I have ever known about, much less associated with. We were so lucky to have Bob Vance as our city attorney and our board attorney. And when we decided to form our school system, we had no money, no property. All we had was we want to do it. And so we formed our school system. Within three weeks, we were sued for operating a dual school system, one for whites and one for blacks. We hadn't even opened the door yet. Things were bad back in the uh, 60s and early 70s, and I will say to you that Bob Vance is the only lawyer, looking back on it, that could have navigated us through the federal court system to let us uh, form our school system. Bob was blown up by a crazy person in 1989. Uh, he was sitting in his kitchen in Mountain Brook with his wife and he got a package in the mail and it was a pipe bomb and it blew him up and killed him in 1989 and what a loss it was. And when Jimmy, the, the Bar Association recognized Bob Vance's ability and they begged him, Bob, you need to get on the bench, try cases that would have bored Bob Vance to death. But to illustrate to you how smart he was, when Jimmy Carter, President Carter, put him on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, they had nine judges. Bob Vance wrote more opinions than all other eight combined, and not a single time was he reversed. Not one time. He was brilliant. And back when... Uh, we were we were just getting off the ground, and this was the summer before we opened our door, and we had some meetings down there. Nancy and I were big proponents. Patrick was two, and Julie was four. We wanted a school system, and we worked hard for it. And Bob Vance was down in the federal court, and if you ever been to federal court, it's like a tomb. You speak when you're spoken to, and you better not bring a newspaper or, or make any noise. Chewing gums out of the question. And uh, 
uh, the judge looked at Bob Vance and said, Mr. Vance, said, we all know that Vestavia is forming the school system for the wrong reason. And you want to avoid integration. And, but we're going to let you do it. But just to make sure that you're doing it for the right reason, we're going to include in your school district the Oxmoor Valley. And the Oxmoor Valley was predominantly poor people. Most of them were minorities. And you're going to take these school children when they're in the seventh <coughs> grade and you're going to educate them and you're not going to charge them tuition and you're going to buy some buses and you're going to bring them to and from school. And Bob Vance said, uh, no, sir, we got no intention of doing that. The judge and Bob Vance happened to be privately were best of friends. And Mr. Vance, you obviously didn't hear what I said. I heard every word you said, Judge. We're not going to do that. Mr. Vance, you're about that far from contempt of court and going to jail. You better explain to me what you're talking about. He said, Judge, don't give them to us in the seventh grade. Give them to us in the first grade. And we took them in the first grade. And that's how we came up. Sarah Wuska was talking about when we needed a new school in 1977. And the city was broke. We didn't have any money to build a park. Julie and Patrick didn't have a place to play. And this sweet lady right here engineered an effort to raise the money, buy the equipment. The city didn't even want to install the equipment at the park. Nancy went up there and talked to the mayor and uh, said, we don't need y'all, we'll, we'll do it ourselves. So in January, we went up there one January and installed this equipment. And about a year later, when we needed a school, we had no money, no land. All we had was we knew we were popping in the seams, student population wise. And uh, the Wall Sisters, had named Wall Park after their father. And uh, old man John Foster was their lawyer and he was trying to prevail upon them to release the covenant from Wall Park so that we could use three and a half acres to build West Elementary School. And they said under no circumstances are we gonna do that. The answer is no and that's fine. They came back, the plans for West School were on hold and uh, I said, well, let me take a shot at it. So I called them and they invited me over to, uh, to their house in Forest Park on a Sunday afternoon. They called me Mr. Boone. I was about 12 years old. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, I went in there and I, 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 I asked them, I said, well, I'm here to ask a favor of you. Well, what's that, Mr. Boone? How can we help you? I said, well, I'm here to ask you to release the covenant so we can build a new school building. They said, well, why should we do that? It's plain and clear. It's in the covenant. Why should we do that? I said, well, when there was no money and no land and no equipment, for little children to play on. We had to go to the Bo Lewis Park in Homewood for the kitty park down there to play. When we had no place for the toddlers to play, my wife went up there and built the finest park you could do. And in honor of your father, she built that park for the toddlers. When, and why should we do it? I said, well, when our children needed a place to play, Nancy Boone did. Now they need a place to go to school. Well, yes, sir, well, by all means, we'll, we'll release the covenant. Never will forget those two ladies must have been older than 90. And uh, uh, Mildred and Edna Wall. And uh, about 10 years later, Miss Mildred called me up 
And you know, I have no authority to bind the city or the board. All I can do is give them legal advice. This little quaint voice called me on the telephone and said, Mr. Ben, this is Mildred Wall. Do you remember me? I said, Miss Mildred, I could never forget you for what the nice things that you did uh, for us and let us build a school. She said, well, do you remember when you wanted uh, us to do a favor for you and we did it? I said, I'll never forget that either. She said, well, Y'all have just built the Arthur Young soccer field down there and put brand new sod on the ground. And we need to drop a sewer line across your park to get to our property. I said, well, I have no authority to tell you this, but the answer is yes, we will do it. And we did do it. <laughs> and everybody lived happily ever after. And, um, at any rate, when Bob Vance went on the bench, um, Bill Clark, the superintendent, and Jack Grace, the mayor, came to my office. I never applied for this job. The reason I didn't apply for it, Scott, you'll know this, as a young lawyer, sometimes you don't feel like you're qualified to do things. I have no hesitancy at my age to tell somebody I don't know how to do it. If I don't know how to do it. Doesn't mean I'm a bad boy, it just means I don't know how to do it. And uh, Bill Clark and Jack Grace came to see me and said, Pat, we want you to be the lawyer for the school board and we want you to be the lawyer for the city to take Bob Vance's place and I started laughing. I said, there is not a lawyer in the world that can take Bob Vance's place. And uh, at any rate, I said, y'all gonna have to let me think about it. My hesitancy was, I didn't feel competent to do it. Nobody could take his place. I had no experience in education law or city law much. My father had passed away and I didn't have anybody much to talk to except Nancy's dad. And he said, son, you need to do it. And uh, Judge Bill Barber, Jay, Ann Barber's dad was a circuit court judge and I went to see him and I said, Judge, I need some fatherly advice since my father has passed away. I said, I explained it to him and I told him, I said, I feel inadequate compared to Mr. Vance. Anybody would. He said, Pat, you've tried 25 cases before me. You're the perfect age for it. I've seen what you do, and you should take the job. We have very few lawyers living up here. You're the perfect age for it. You got the temperament for it. You got the interest for it. Take the job. I took the job. In the first month, one of Judge Barber's cases in the Alabama Supreme Court got reversed. And it was an argument over some of the industrial development property down in the Oxmoor Valley where Homewood, the county, and the city of Birmingham were arguing over who was going to get to have control of this property in, in the Oxmoor Valley. And Judge Barber tried that case for 30 days, and the Supreme Court reversed it on the grounds that the city of Vestavia Hills was not consulted. You got to get the permission if the property's in the in the police jurisdiction. And uh, so the case was reversed. And now the case has got to be tried and I'm going to go up there and sit and be the lawyer for the city of Vestavia Hills. I can't hurt the city. I can't help the city. The city can't be affected by this thing. The only one that was going to win was me. I was going to get 30 days pay for sitting up there doing nothing. <laughs> and uh, I'm against that. And I advised Jack Grace, I said, please authorize me to tell the Supreme Court that we're not interested in the outcome of the case because it can't affect us one way or another. So we did. About a week later, 
I had a case at the other end of the hall from Judge Barber before Judge Thompson, and I heard this awful sound. Pat Boone, get out of my office right now. I said, Lord, have mercy. I'm either going to get this bar to face the firing squad. I went down there to Judge Barber's office. Shut the door, boy. Judge Barber chopped wood as a hobby, and he could, like Abraham Lincoln, he could hold an axe straight out. Shut the door, boy. Sit down. Judge Barber hit the top of that table. Books and papers flew everywhere. He said, I told you that you were the right person for the job. And the good Lord told me right after I took it, just that one instance, that one case, that I had made the, the right decision. And 47 years later, I say to all of you, all 40,000 of us that own this school system, thank you for letting me be on this team. It's the best team I've ever been on. Thank you. here see you tonight and share stories with you uh, in the interest of time we need to try to conclude our meeting before the next morning. It's a mistake. Stop it. We can do it. I'm glad you did, but they all have a lot of great things to say. We'd like the folks here to see you tonight. Thank you. I wish you to know how appreciated you are in the world to the community, all of us. It makes a lot. And we have, I think, some cake and things like that for after the meeting, so you can hang in there for a little while. We'll conduct our business. Thank you. We will uh, adjourn, adjourn and do that. Okay, I understand right. if you want to come back. You need to step out and come back. That's all right. <laughs> thank you for coming, Sam and Pat and Howard. Oh, thank you. They're all graduates, by the way. Board members will move to our financial statement. Good afternoon, board members. I've provided the February 29th, 2024 financial statements to check register for your review. As of February 29th, we have collected 100.4% of our budgeted ad valorem tax revenues compared to the 73.5% we received last, last year on the state. In February, we earned $153,585 in interest income on our investment in Treasury Suite. And our total expenditures and transfers out of the general fund as of February 29th were 45.9% of the budget compared to 45.7% last year. In the fifth month of our fiscal year, with all things being equal, we would be at 41%, 41.6% of our budgeted expenditures. And we are a little above that due to payments for some annual expenditures and an early Chromebook lease payoff. Our monthly financial statements and check registers are available for viewing on our website upon board approval, and all bank accounts have been reconciled as of 2-29-24. Courtney, board members, I recommend approval of the financial statement for February 2024. I the superintendent's recommendation to approve the financial statement for February 2024. Do I have a motion to approve? So Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Uh, consent items are presented for you as well. I have six. I recommend the board approve consent items related to out of state, overnight in state, and overnight out of state field trips. And these are academic, athletic, and uh, other competition related trips. Heard the superintendent's recommendation to approve out of state, overnight in state, and overnight out of state field trips. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Under business, our first item is for budget amendment one. And board members, I recommend the approval of budget amendment one as presented. For the superintendent's recommendation to approve budget amendment number one. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. 
board members say each year we will typically do one or two budget amendments to the general fund and this is the first one up uh, you've got the summary of what those things are that add some expenditures into the budget according to just a little background typically on why these amendments occur uh, budget amendment one is required to record the actual ending fund balance for fy23 which is our beginning budgeted fund balance for fy24 um, we have to tree that up and then there was also some state allocations that came in after the budget was approved in the fall or in august they came in september so um, we had to record those and also um, some safety expenditures that had not been um, originally included in the budget. Okay, thank you. On favor? Um, uh, item B, I recommend the board approve the change order to the contract with Schneider Electric. For the superintendent's recommendation to approve the change order to the contract with Schneider Electric, I have a motion to approve. <coughs> so moved. Second. 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 This is a good change order, it's no cost. We're just switching some equipment uh, in the uh, contract with Schneider. All in favor? Uh, Item C, I recommend the board approve the bid with Duncan and Thompson Construction Services, LLC, for the girls' locker room shower renovation at the Seve Hills High School. You heard the superintendent's recommendation to approve the bid with Duncan and Thompson Construction Services, LLC, for the girls' locker room shower renovation at the high school. Do I have a motion to approve? Second. Second. Board members, we've been working on this project for several months. Last year, we really identified some shortages with what is a burgeoning, growing uh, program of athletics for female uh, athletes at the high school. We simply don't have enough shower space for it, and so we're going to take the existing lockers and add some shower spaces to that. Tony, you got anything you want to add to that one? Um, <laughs> yes, right now we've got temporary ones in the back, uh, and by that I mean it's a trailer that's got shower space in it that we want to be done with that business sometime this summer uh, upon your approval. All in favor? Uh, item D, I recommend the board approve the contract with Duncan and Thompson Construction Services, LLC, for the girls' locker room shower renovation at West City Hills High School. For the superintendent's recommendation to approve the contract with Duncan and Thompson Construction Services LLC for the girls' locker room shower renovation at the State of Eagles High School. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Right. Item E, I recommend the board approve the West Davie Hills Elementary East principal contract for Cynthia Eccles. Per the superintendent's recommendation to approve the Best Davy Hills Elementary East principal contract for Cynthia Eccles. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Mark? <laughs> Are we making a good choice here? <laughs> Go by a series about this. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments? You made it was the best choice of all time. I cannot say enough about Cindy. She's been a principal, not only officially at Edgewood Elementary, but really for the last 12 years, she's been a principal. She's done everything I've done and then some. Uh, it's been like having two principals, quite honestly, and she probably knows a lot more about running a school than I do. So the transition will be seamless and I can't say enough. Great. I'm so happy. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. But you're assistant principal, right? Yeah. You're going oh. to be her assistant. <laughs> I'm at five, just sorry. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Uh, item F, I recommend the board approve the West Tavia Hills Elementary West principal contract for Susan McCall. You heard the superintendent's recommendation to approve West Tavia Hills Elementary West principal contract for Susan McCall. Do you have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. She's so walked aye. beside me for eight years and she knows the job as well as I do. So I uh, echo what Mark said about Cindy. I can't say enough things. And my school would have been devastated if you had named anyone else. <laughs> All in favor. All right. All right. I want to share with you just as an aside to these contracts that uh, one of the great benefits of having great leaders that uh, love the school system and are retiring is that they get to come in back and work with us in the form of mentors. And so we will be engaged in services with Mark and Cindy and Tanya mm -hmm. uh, for mentorships with principals. Nice, I'm sorry, Kim. <laughs> 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 Mark and Kim. Easy to forget, right? 
be working on that with them and mentoring what we're principals next year. And I think that's a great value. I'm really appreciative of that. Okay, item G. I recommend the board approve the salary schedule to include registered <laughs> behavioral therapists. For the superintendent's recommendation to approve the revised salary schedule to include registered behavioral therapists. We have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Board members, you approved the job description last month for registered behavioral therapists. And essentially what I would just remind you that we said we would do is this is some specialized training. Uh, that we're providing for paras and one pair in each building would become a registered behavioral therapist. Uh, the salary schedule is a little bit different. So while we've asked you to approve that and we can begin advertising for the positions, uh, I think this is a really uh, good step forward in terms of uh, working smarter and uh, more immediately meeting needs in the school for our students. So upon your approval, we'll get that advertised for next year. All in favor? Uh -huh. All right. Item eight is personnel, and I recommend the board approve the personnel actions as submitted. You've heard the superintendent's recommendation to approve the personnel items submitted. All in favor? Or motion to approve? <laughs> so moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Uh -huh. All right, thank you. I want to move to a couple of administrative reports for you this evening. Uh, the first one is just a brief uh, conversation with you about budget priorities we've been talking about. Are you ready for that with? Yes. Yeah, so I'll just show you one image and then we're going to jump into demography. Uh, I've been speaking this year generally about four budget priorities as we plan for the future. And last month you heard a little bit about the academic program side when we talked about the need to and desire to uh, place additional emphasis on STEM in our schools that by adding a K-5 STEM teacher in elementary grades, by enhancing mathematics in our middle grades and health science and hopefully engineering uh, in our uh, secondary high school grades. And so the other components of this pyramid structure is just a reminder of the priorities in which we want to place uh, for budgeting to get all of those things done. Uh, the one at the bottom is the budget reserve that we want to continue to focus on and the state requires that we have one month reserve. Uh, we think we'll end at 1.4 with our current budget, but according I do believe that that's going to grow a little bit larger and get within parameters of what this board of think believes is a responsible budget. Uh, I think the stretch goal is we'd like to have two months of a budget reserve or savings. I don't know that we achieved that this year, but we're certainly moving closer which allows us to begin to focus on some other things. Uh, we have been talking about the importance of hiring and keeping the best teachers. And there's a lot of ways that we focus and attempt to do that in our schools, but one of the very important ones is compensation. Uh, by getting our budget reserve in a place where it, where it can be, uh, at the end of this fiscal year, we think we can start looking at how we address uh, more competitive pay structure for our teachers. And I look forward to talking with you more about that. Uh, in addition to that, we have been talking about the facility improvement needs in our system. And uh, I mentioned to you that, generally speaking, we have about $35 million plus improvements we know need to be done uh, to mechanical systems, to uh, roofing uh, systems, to water systems, to controls with our mechanical systems. We have a great deal of needs we know in our system that we've been talking about for several years. We do not necessarily have an answer for that today because it would require uh, a financing mechanism and we don't have the funds to do that at this point. Uh, there are additional general needs of our facilities that I would estimate to be at least $20 million more dollars. Uh, so we're being as creative and thoughtful as we can about how to get this accomplished, but the reality is we do not have a budget or anticipated revenues to do that at this time. So we have been taking pieces of work as we can get funds in the state department uh, the legislature last year awarded us several million dollars that we've been able to do some funds uh, some fund projects with security money we've been able to do some projects with but there remains still a, a pretty significant gap in what we can get accomplished one of the things that i shared with the city council in some recent work sessions is that there's an opportunity to think creatively about partnerships and because we share spaces with the city for recreational programs and that's fields and gym spaces uh, i've asked them to consider an opportunity about how they might partner with us and the city council is going to be considering some of those options in the coming 
the days, I believe, in their council meetings, and I look forward to hear more about them. But all of this is an effort to try to partner uniquely where we can to get projects done and then look for the best long-term solutions to what we can do for our current facility needs. When you are considering facility needs, there are really three drivers that go into that. The first one is enrollment. How many students do you have? And do you have the space for those students? The second thing is what's the condition of the facilities that you do have, which is really what I'm talking about now. And the third thing is, are there academic programs that we would like to put in place that would mean we would need more facilities? Uh, last year's conversation during our tax initiative was mostly around conditions of facilities and academic programs. Because that was unsuccessful, we've been zeroing in on just those conditions, what we need to do. Fortunately, the board in the last decade grew our campuses to a point where enrollment is, is in good shape. And our capacities, we're well within our capacities, and that's a good thing. Uh, but we wanted to be thoughtful about making sure as we're planning ahead, we have, we're thinking about what can happen with enrollment and what forecast of enrollment is going to look like over the next 10 years. And so I asked Jerry McKibben uh, our team, to join our team back here in the summer and begin to look at the, the enrollment forecasting in our district uh, and make some recommendations to us about things we can be thinking about. So Jerry is here. Hello, sir. Sir, come on in. I appreciate you joining us, and you have the board, you have the report with you, uh, board members, and so we're going to make this available online after this board meeting for the community to see. But Jerry has done a fantastic job on this, and I appreciate it. Thanks for being here, Jerry. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Freeman, and I'm sure person, members of the board. Uh, two things I want to go over before I get into the details of the presentation, and I'll just wave my hand that you're going to. Uh, no, so there's a clicker on the podium. Oh, I have to do it. I'm mm -hmm. going <laughs> to charge extra for that. You know, right on. Uh, two things. One, these are forecasts. They are not projections. Okay. <clears throat> a projection is where you take a variable, usually year to year survivorship, second, third, third, and fourth, over a period of time, three, four, five years, create an algorithm, and use that to literally project into the future. Very quick, simple, easy, up until about the mid-1990s, all you had in the way of enrollment research. The problem with the projection is, it's almost always wrong. Because the only way a projection can be correct is what's happened in the last five years, replicates itself over the next five or ten. I don't know about anybody here, I don't want to see the last five years again in my lifetime. Okay. Forecast is different. It's a two-step procedure. We do a full population forecast, 0 to 4, 85 plus, male and female, for each one of the elementary tenants there. We build a fertility, mortality, migration model based specifically on each area's demographic characteristics and all the data we lay our hands on. Birth, death, housing tenure, migration, age structure, um, household size, family formation, everything we lay our hands on in the 2020 census. The results of that population forecast then drives the enrollment forecast. So it's your current and future demographic dynamics and characteristics that dictate your enrollment, not your past trends. <clears throat> Point two, don't let Rock Hill, South Carolina fool you. Uh, I'm in the process of my wife and I moving down here to Alabama. When I get done at Homewood tomorrow night, I get to drive down to Baldwin County and walk through at least 15 houses my wife's got picked out down there to go through. And, Give me two seconds and contain my enthusiasm about that. But, uh, <laughs> I look at more houses down there than Carter's got liver pills. Um, anyway, anytime you're doing a forecast, you have to have assumptions. These are broad socioeconomic demographic parameters, so to speak, that we use to build a forecast model. That's, uh, there you go. Oh, there it is. The back button to it? Yes, the bottom. There we are. Okay. Now, I don't want to go through all of them, but I want to go through the big four. The big four are the ones that have the highest probability of variability going into the future. Okay? And number one is B. We assume, assume the 30-year fixed interest rate will stay between 5.5 and 7.5% over the 10-year life of the forecast. Um, this morning was just under 7%. Now, why is it so important to drive your housing market? Uh, you can't, can't buy a house, you can get a mortgage. And 
for the first time ever in U.S. history over the last two year period, the 30 year fixed mortgage rates have doubled. That's never happened before. Jerome Powell's given every indication he's taking his foot off the gas, but he's not putting his foot on the brake. So if it they does start dropping rates, it's going to be later this year. And I don't think we're going to see below 5% again, probably in our lifetimes. Uh, and that's a generational problem. So those of us old enough to remember the 70s, 80s, 90s, into the 2000s, when the 30-year fixed rate was 8, 10, 12, 14%, 7% sounds pretty good. Kids today, that's anybody in the age of 40, seen nothing but three, three and a half, and four for the last decade. Seven's on the highway robbery. So it's really going to start slowing down the housing market, and that becomes a key variable moving on. Okay. The other one I want to go or particularly go over is um, average unemployment rates with seven and a half percent, and uh, student transfer rate stays the same. Oops, went the wrong way on that. Um, Q and R are the two big ones, okay? We assume the district will average 70 new um, home sales per year. Now, over the last decade, uh, the district picked up about, about 120 housing units per year. Pretty brisk growth rate. Um, we see that to continue on. The biggest issue is R. At least 650 existing home sales. This is where people start getting confused. We see this all over, we're in 23 states across the country. Everybody fixates on new home construction. But new home construction is only 10 to 20% of your housing market. Existing home sales is the backbone of it. You could build 300 new household housing units a year in this district. If you don't sell any existing homes, your enrollment drops, okay? So the pace and magnitude of the existing home sales is actually your key variable. Now, as we come out of COVID, one of the issues is the elderly just stopped moving. The elderly mortality or mobility rates over 65 have just crawled. That's why you've got a housing shortage right now. Are there any realtors in the audience? Okay, what's the supply of houses on the market right now? Very low. Hor horrible. Where she's yes. seen 30 years, well, you wouldn't murder 30 years ago anyway, <laughs> but uh, where she's ever seen. It's the worst you've seen in like 50 years. And the reason for that, the elderly have just stopped moving, okay? Uh, they stopped during the pandemic and they're not picking it up again. So the developers, seeing the opportunity, are trying to push through everything they've got in the pipeline, not just here or in Alabama, but all over the country. There's no way that 15 to 20% of the housing market can make up for that shortfall. There was a great piece on Bloomberg just two months ago. They looked at the 200 largest metropolitan areas in the country, compared their total 2023 home sales 2019 pre-COVID, and in only eight of those 200 metropolitan areas was it back at the 2019 levels? Most are running 20, 20 percent below. So you look at it out there, and look at there's this giant housing boom going on. In reality, your total home sales are less than they were five years ago. And you have to look at all the back factors at once. So that was one of the key ones. You'll have no trouble hitting that uh, 70 new homes this year. I'm worried about the 650, okay? because that's going to depend on primarily people over the age of 65 moving out. And if they don't start moving, they're not giving any indication it is. Uh, because most people with kids move between <coughs> April and August, when you start looking at your April home sales numbers, I use Zillow, RealtyTrack, Realtor.com, and all that, you should be creeping up to 150, 200 homes on the market. If you're not, you're probably too low. If it's above that, That'd be pretty good. But again, this is people wanting to move their houses and downsize to go someplace. So <clears throat> corollary problem on that is we didn't build any elder housing in this country. We did never have, but it's a shortage all, all over the United States. So now the number one predictive variable for future population enrollment growth is not births, it's not death, it's not migration, it's age structure. 
How is your population distributed across the life course? This will refer to in demography as a population pyramid. Very easy to read. <clears throat> this is from the 2020 census. This is the district. Zero to four, that's your preschoolers. At your elementary, at your middle, at your high school. 20 to 34 years old, what we call family uh, formation ages. 80% of all births occur to women between the ages of 20 and 34 years old. Median age of first birth in the U.S. is about 28. If you don't have women in prime childbearing age, it doesn't matter what your total fertility rate, it can be nine. You're not going to have that many births. Okay? Like most suburban areas, <laughs> you don't have, you have a little dearth there in prime childbearing age. Why? Because you don't come out of college and buy a house and rent an apartment. You have some apartments here, but not enough. You're going to go to an urban area, just like any place else. It could be Atlanta, it could be Memphis, it could be Nashville, you know, Charlotte, where I live. People move into there. Then they start having kids. Not many people want to raise their kids in an apartment, though. So when the oldest one gets to be about five, six, seven years old, then they start moving out to uh, single family attached homes, either new or existing. 35 to 54 are the ages where most people have kids in schools. How many people here are parents? Okay, how many in those age groups? Right, okay. Uh, all those hands should have up. There are exceptions. I was one, I was a first time father at 40, so I was 58 when my son graduated high school. Everybody told me what a nice, well behaved grandson I had. But uh, those are the people who shut their school board meetings. Now, here's where it gets tricky. 55 to 69 is what we refer to as the empty nest households, okay? Get the Smith family living down the road there, went there for 20 years. 10 years ago, it was mom, dad, and two kids. But now 10 years later, the kids have grown up, graduated high school, gone off to college and moved away. Same home, same homeowner, but it's to the four persons per household, you only have two. So that's one of your main out-migration factors. A, your 18 to 22 year old, that's your main out-migration flow right now. How much empty nesting is going to go on? You don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to figure out that big wave of people who moved out last decade are going to start empty nesting over the next five to 10 years and going into the 30s. That's the flow people don't remember because 70 and over were called the turnover ages. Now, You'll see a slight uptick at 62, another one at 65. Most people don't downsize to their 70s. Everybody notices, you know, the they call the Florida flow or the Texas, you know. Those tend to be the early elderly households in their 60s, still two-person households, relatively wealthy, uh, relatively healthy too, and move out. What we call early elderly migration only makes up about 10 to 15 percent of the elderly migration. Most don't downsize to their 70s. It's not retirement that triggers downsizing. It's either the death of one of the spouses or they both lose the ability to drive. And it was one thing about Stevie Hills, you have to have a car live around here. Okay, it's pretty easy. That's house maintenance becomes an issue. You know. So as you see more and more homeowners move into their mid and late 70s, then you're going to see more and more of those houses turn over. So you can see at the district total, and we have all these pyramids in your report for each one of the elementary tenants areas because there's a wide difference across the district. You can't use district level trends in each tenants area. You're going to see an increase in people aging into those turnover ages, but you have a much bigger flow aging into their 50s and empty nesting. Also, talk about empty nest, we tend to think of the last child graduating high school. Expand that definition. You can be empty nest of preschool. You can be empty nest of preschool and elementary. Preschool, elementary, and middle school. You currently have and will have a growing number of households that still have kids in the school district, but there's no more preschoolers coming in. There's no more elementary kids coming in. They're going to be middle and high schoolers. And that's going to be a dominant trend going forward in the next four or five years. Now, think of this as a district average I do this right. Yep. Here is uh, Cava Heights. Not surprisingly, you'll see this in the later say, census numbers. No deficit here. 
in the 20s and 30s. Why? That's where the bulk of the districts and parties are at. You would expect to see that. You go to Dolly Ridge, where you have a high proportion of single family homeowners, you see even more exaggerated hourglass pattern. You know, the, these distributions will always match up with the data. East is somewhere in between. Okay, Liberty Park, again, high proportion of uh, individual homeowners. Anytime you have a greater proportion of homeowners, you're going to have a lack of people in their 20s because they don't buy houses in their 20s, they buy them in their 30s. And then finally, you have West, again, more close to the district average. So looking at the numbers here, and this is mostly for comparison purposes, district total, you can see uh, only a third of the households in the district have under 18 population. This is actually pretty normal for a suburban area. So it's so hard to get bonds through, you're out number two to one, okay? That includes preschoolers, by the way. But it varies, you know, get 25% in Cahaba Heights, the 49% in Liberty Park. Again, another reason why you can't use a district average, each individual tenant area has its own unique characteristics. Same thing with household size. 255 for the district, but runs over to 2.14 all the way up to three, okay? Now, a very crude measurement here, traditional two-parent household, mom, dad, whatever the point is, is kids. You're looking at under 18 population, usually uh, in the household. Now, a difference here of, you know, between 0.72 and 3.0, let's what difference, what, to 0.28, it doesn't sound like a lot until you multiply it by almost 2,000 housing units. Rather a substantial number there. So... These variations are going to be by housing tenures, that we call owner versus renter, household size, family structure, all play a part in this uh, building the models. Uh, Householders 35, 54, the ages where most people have kids in school, again, 37%, but a wide range from 30% to 50%. This is not uncommon in suburban areas where you have newly developed area, established core areas, you can have these wide differences. Uh, over 65, over a quarter, and it's going up. East is already, uh, and East and Dolly are already above uh, 30%. These are the areas where you'll start seeing the turnover first because they have the older population, high home ownership rates. And 74% home ownership rate, again, wide range, 60 to the 80, 81, 85, things like that. Owners and renters have two completely different dynamics, okay? Renters tend to be younger, are still uh, family formation ages. We refer to rental areas as family formation areas. Um, are still having kids. A lot of their children are still preschoolers, and they move an average every two years. Homeowners, older, have completed their family formation for the most part, and move an average every 14 years, much more stable population. So the dynamics of the two, um, when you see new homes being built and homeowners, kids come there, that's usually the full impact. But in rental areas, a lot of those preschoolers aren't going to be there five years later. They're going to move out with their parents, usually someplace else and in their part of the school district. Single person households, about 25%. And again, a wide range in here. But single and over the age of 65, these are ones frequently where you have a spouse die already. That's what probably will start turning over the next three or four years. So here with the high proportions here in Dolly, that's probably where you're gonna start seeing the, uh, the impact first. Now, this is my favorite data from the 2020 census. To individual year of age. We do this at the school and the district level. Now, in 2020, five year olds, that's your kindergarten, six year olds, first grade, seven year olds, second grade, and so on. But now, here in fall of 2023, when we base this data on, these two year olds are not your kindergarten, first grade, second, third, and fourth. We can see the relative size of each cohort aging in. We can also look at the trends. Now, two things, district level, 
Notice how the cohorts are in the 600s here, drop into the fives, down into the fours. Again, very common in suburban areas. You don't have enough births in the district to maintain your own. If nobody moves in, nobody moves out, you left your own demographic devices, your elementary enrollment drops to about 200 students in five years without any migration. When people see a new household move in, they instinctively want to add it to what you already have in enrollment, not realizing these preschool cohorts behind it are smaller. Until you fill in that preschool deficit, you're not going to have growth. So for the 2019 birth cohort, within five years, you need 100 kids born in 2019 to move in by 2024 to break even. You're going to do it, but you have to fill in that deficit. The other useful tool here is looking at relative cohort size. East is a good example. 120 drops to 105, goes up to 145. This cohort comes in or up 40 kids. It must be building its growth and all the people just go wild and all this. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's just a, a big cohort coming in. Then drop back down to 121. This allows us to take year-to-year -year variances and noise out of the data. So we're not forecasting. That's why trend analysis is so bad. Because you'll get one year of uh, big growth. It, it won't must be growth, you know. Well, no, it's been cohort. And we can take that out. At the district level, what we do is we take your actual enrollment by grade and compare it to the actual census cohort size. The numbers in red are your first grade for that year. So in 2020, you had 462 first graders, which is 91% of that cohort size. Now there's second graders, third, fourth this year. If the proportions go up, it's in migration. If it goes down, it's out migration, okay? So we can track it by school, by grade cohort, and this helps us build our fertility models. 101, 102, 117, 104, we can see where the impact of new kids moving in are coming from. So as you get in the later grades, it stays pretty constant in the high 90s. By the way, most school districts in the United States right now, these numbers are in their 80s. You guys are doing much, much better than most school districts in the U.S. Bounce back nicely from COVID. Because no school district gets 100%. You've got private, you've got charter, you've got homeschool, you've got transfers. So most of urban school districts, it's somewhere in the 80s, you're already up in the 90s. So you guys are doing, doing pretty good. We geocode the students, do this for two reasons. One, we want to put the kids back in their home attendance areas. We can link up um, the demographic variables with the actual kids who live in the home attendance area and also account for your out of district students. Now, again, I've, we've done over a couple thousand school districts. You guys got some of the tightest boundaries I've ever seen for suburban districts. Most kids in this district go to their assigned attendance area. This is a whole bunch in Indiana where 15, 20, 25 percent of the kids do not attend school their home attendance area. Uh, their, their boundaries are basically a joke. But um, we did it for preschool, did it for the elementary, middle school, and of course, the high school. <coughs> the big thing is we want to look at where the odd district kids are coming from and where they're going. So we don't contaminate the forecast results with odd district kids mistaking it for domestic or internal growth. Get maps on that later. All of this goes into a population forecast. <clears throat> Again, this is the district total. Your report has one for each one of the attendance areas. There's two ways to read this. Look at the five to nines, that's basically elementary. And you can follow you know, 28, 27, 25, 26, okay, or follow an age cohort over time. Zero to four becomes five to nine, becomes 10 to 14, becomes 15 to 19. Median age going up. Everybody's median age is going up because of the aging baby boom. 
the peak of the baby boom is 67 this year and the front end is 77. So 10 years from now, they're going to be 77 and 87. These are what we call the components of change. Five years birth, deaths, natural increase, net migration, and change. Births steady dropping off, not because of drop in birth rate, but due to a drop in number of women who are childbearing age. Deaths are going up, not because of disease or COVID or anything like that, <clears throat> due to an aging population. We have more people we call prior dying age. Uh, I don't get to find a better term than that, but that's what we call it. Um, natural increase, excess of births over death, goes negative. Even before COVID, we had four states and 800 counties in the United States with more deaths than births. Went wilder than COVID, now it's kind of gone back, and we're still probably going to pick up three or four more states this decade, and probably about 400 more counties. This is the dominant demographic trend <coughs> in the U.S. next 10 years, aging the population. We're going to lose natural increases in growth of the vehicle. Net migration for the period, 560, 620, 5870. Well, that sounds low. I know we got more than 560 people moving over the five-year period. You do. It's net migration. Your biggest in migration flows are people 30 to 44 years old bring zero to nine-year-olds with them. Your biggest out migration flows are 18 to 20 year olds graduating high school and going off to college and people over the age of seven. Take the in minus the out, and that's we come up with 560. Very healthy flow. The results of this pop forecast then drive the aroma forecast. All right, now, the analogy I use here is a bucket of water. If I've got a bucket of water, I'm pouring water on the top. There's a hole in the bottom. As long as I'm pouring in faster than it's running out the bottom, the level will rise. But if for some reason the hole in the bottom gets bigger, and it's now going out faster than I'm pouring in, even pouring in at the same rate, the level will drop. And Roma works the same way. What's the size of your K in one cohort that's coming in versus the size of your 12th grade cohort that's going out? Okay? And you've been averaging well, about 4 at 90, you've got some relatively large cohorts going out. You're going to be above 500 for the rest of the decade. You've got more going out. You'll notice that we've got the um, uh, elementary enrollment staying pretty flat, slight decline to it. And the decline is due to will there be enough homes on the market to allow new young households to move in to fill in that deficit? Given our parameters on this, not quite. Just, you know, maybe you'll have a whole bunch of homeowners decide, well, let's get all the good <laughs> house prices are high, <clears throat> someplace else retire, they start dumping their homes in the market, then you'll have more people that can move back. You can't build enough to make up that deficit. You're going to have some existing home sales. So that, that 600 plus number for existing home sales is very, very key. Did that 20 minutes, that's pretty good for me. <laughs> I usually go on for half an hour. Jerry, the area that you and I have talked about a good bit was Liberty Park, where mm -hmm. there's a fairly large yep. single family development that's coming into play. And uh, we'll put our estimates were out there for the 10 year forecast. I know it's in your total report, but maybe just a little elaboration on that area. Right. Um, Go back to Liberty Park here. Uh, yeah, okay. So they're going to put those houses, they're going to put some apartments up there as well, too, and that's even more beneficial because they've got the lowest proportion of 20 year olds in any area of the district. They've also got the biggest deficit, okay? So they build them, and we got them on a five year build out for the homes, three year for the apartments. Should keep you have the enrollment go up a little bit enough to fill in that deficit, okay? Because this is a significantly smaller without these going in, you drop of 125, 150 students in five years. That's going to more than take care of that and have some growth going forward, okay? 
but this is the key here. <coughs> you know there's that instinctive thing, oh, we're going to build, you know, 500 housing units in five years. It sounds like it's going to overrun. That's a big hole you got to fill in, normal wise. Because again, we go back to the number one factor. Nowhere in the district, with the possible exception of, let me see here, no, not even, no, not even Catawba. We've got the apartments. Every east is probably one's closest with the smallest deficit, but Liberty's got the biggest one. Okay, so it's good they're building them up there because he's had a moment decline if they weren't. The other thing with Liberty is there's a lot of empty nesting going on, but very, very small increase in the turnover ages. You just don't have that many households out there. So that was one of the last developed areas of the district. And we did this as a 10 year forecast as well. And we did this as a 10 year forecast. Yes. Yeah. Your study is a 10 year forecast. Uh, I believe that only I don't know if we want to use the word significant on it, but the but the growth that occurs in elementary <clears throat> over that forecast was more compliance. Okay. Um, got that. I don't know if you have that or not. It wasn't a fast sort of growth. I didn't hear any of that. Cahaba Heights was the was of the five elementary zones. Yeah. That ten year forecast to show them was some increases going up, not substantial and fast, but some no, increases so. going up. The other schools generally holding about where they are, right. with, with some little bit of decrease. The, I think the point you really have to remember, both both the board and as the public, um, every child in the district, third grade and higher right now, is gone by 2023, 2033. They're gone. Okay. Your first grade cohort of 2030, not even born yet. Okay. So, where are they going to live? You know, they've got to have, that's where it comes into how much empty, how much your household are empty desk, how many are going on the market, plus we've got building going on. But building alone can't do it. You need to get busy out there. <laughs> That so we'll ask the empty nester to just move away and we'll solve the problem. Yeah. yeah. It, it affords a lot of conversation, I feel like, for uh, long term facility planning. As I mentioned, the student enrollment drives that unless it's not driving it. Yeah. And we're within capacity in our 10 year enrollment numbers. I can't see them at the end, but we don't show virtually any growth in that forecast. Um, most of these declines, the first four years at district level, is because you've got these pretty good sized high school cohorts going out. But once they're gone, you start going back up again, particularly after 2030. Because then you will start seeing in some areas, particularly down closer to the interstate, you're going to see more and more areas, similar to areas that were you know developed and built in the 80s and 90s and the aughts, they're going to be turning over in relatively large numbers. Up uh, Liberty, that was the last place. You know, it's also kind of hard to get there too. Uh, you should be thanking God you guys don't get snow around here. You wouldn't go any place. You know? <laughs> uh, it, it would be a challenge. Um, and by the way, when did they outlaw the use of turn signals in Alabama? <laughs> <laughs> I was just sort of giving the information to the end. Uh, your, your good neighbors to the north, Homewood, are going to do the same presentation tomorrow night, same boat, same situation. Okay. Uh, almost identical, just the magnitude is different. So this is a, a very, very common problem for suburban school districts, particularly ones that have experienced rather healthy, substantial growth the last 15 years. What people forget is the kids grow up, graduate, move away. So the bigger your cohorts, the more you have to come in because you sure don't have enough births to do it. You know, that's been the situation. If you go back and look at this population pyramid from 2010 for the stevia, it's narrower because you're not as big, but it's the same pattern. You know, go 
back to 20, 2000. It was narrower still, but the same pattern. You know, because it was dominated by single family attached homes. People over the age of 30 when we get I think the parallel track is uh, the financial forecasting that we can do in the next few years and what that development will mean for us, particularly on the commercial side. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're not having to think in the near term about a new elementary school, which doesn't appear we do, uh, what does that development do for us in terms of the potential opportunity to uh, manage the facility issues that we've been talking about? So there's a positive in that, yes. for sure. So, questions for Jake? So, it appears that you believe the main driver of existing home sales is, is the 30-year you know, interest rate? Are there other well, what's the main factor? What, of one, what's one of the factors? What other factors as a board should we be looking at to say in 2024, we saw this expectation, this forecast that existing home sales may not change that much. Mm -hmm. Are there other variables other than the interest rate that we ought to be monitoring to say, Hey, there may be you may be getting to see a shift in that. So I'll spike your own employment rate to do it. Um, that's, that's probably the number two factor. Well, right now that we're looking at lows we haven't seen in 40 years, but um, where your job creation is at, you know, a lot right now is hospitality. Well, that's wonderful and great, but you can't buy a house on that salary. It's got to be tech or professional or or professional services, things like that. Um, you know, basically Birmingham is the, you know, the regional economic engine of the area. Most of the people who move into this area are working from other parts of Birmingham. If Birmingham's economy catches cold, you're going to catch pneumonia. Conversely, uh, there's a substantial economic development, um, read Amazon or Google or something like that particularly the south side of the metropolitan area, that creates demand. But you bring up an interesting point, you know, uh, these other variables. If these existing homeowners don't decide to downsize, it's not going to have any impact at all. You get an unemployment rate of zero and have 100,000 jobs in the bit. If they don't decide to move and go someplace else, you couldn't build enough to make up for that uh, empty nothing you've got going on. That's why you need 600 home sales or a combination. Well, actually, it's closer to 700 combination of new building and, and existing. So that's why this elderly migration decision making process is actually probably your key variable. Thank you. So about seven years ago, the board undertook a study, same type study. And we were experiencing what we were seeing was uh, the I don't know if the forecast would be the right word, but it, an idea that there would be increasing numbers mm -hmm. that we would be facing some difficult issues of enrollment. So, and mm -hmm. your your forecast doesn't indicate that, it, and it didn't happen that way. So, what's different in the study that you have given us versus what we saw? Well, very simple. I know what they're doing, and they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a demographer. You know, I, I they look at one or two variables. They'll look at home sales, home construction, and that's it. Past growth trend. If you took a past growth trend from like 2014 to 2019, this district, and just did a projection, you'd be going up like that. Okay. But if you look at all the variables together, and here's your key one. They didn't look at the fact that, oh my God, we're going to have 100 kids come in a year just to break even. Okay? And compared to the cohorts that are now up in your middle school, it's 150. Okay? They're, they were just only looking at the positive factors and none of the negative factors. Both, everybody I've talked to, my times here doing the field research at Stevia, everybody likes living here. The only people who don't like living here are people between the ages of 16 and 19. <laughs> 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 okay, do, I can't wait to get out of here and all that stuff. Everybody else I've talked to loves it. And that's the problem. They won't leave. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And they plan to retire here. Their friends here, their family support system. 
health care provider, you know, people from work, they like living here. You know? And their kids have grown, moved away. That's the problem. And it goes back to why I look at those pot pyramids. I said, because, you know, when you're looking at all of this, go back to those pyramids, and they tell you so much right off the bat. I'm going the wrong way. I hate this thing. <laughs> uh, go back to the district level. That's the best one. Okay. You're going to have people continue to move in here in there from like 28 to 44 years old. You're going to have home sales. You're going to have new home construction. Okay. No argument there. Problem is, go back 10 years ago, these people weren't there in their 40s. They moved in over the last decade. This, this is the largest section of your adult population. Take them forward 10 years. They're going to be 49 to 60 years old. You're not going to have any preschoolers coming out of those households. So they're going to be all empty nested of uh, preschooler, elementary, middle school, and a lot of them high school. And they're going to stay empty nest for 10 years, 15 years after that. Because they're already here. We can see it coming. There's no mystery to this. But again, look at the rate of population age again of the over 70, you know, where they will start turning over because they bring the best baby boomers, they're not gonna live forever, you know, we are gonna die. So they're either gonna die or can't take care of their homes. But this rate of increase here in your uh, empty nest ages, far, far greater than the increase in the ones turning over. Hence, that's why you see this pattern like this in your enrollment because your housing stock and your housing structure can't support the level of growth you saw last decade. Unless you start building six, seven, eight hundred homes a year. Now, if you do that, that'll change it. Better pass a law banning people at age 65. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So and we will we will again get this posted on for our community safety and make sure everybody's got a uh, at it. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate it. Any other questions come up? Freeman, you know where to find me and send me an email. Happy to answer them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to public comment. If anyone would like to speak today. Um, if an individual is desiring to speak, they shall stand and give his or her name and their address. The presentation should be as brief as possible, and in no event shall such address and exceed three minutes. The speaker may make statements about their particular concern with school operations and programs. In public session, however, the board will not hear personnel complaints against particular school personnel or against any person connected with the school system. Other means are provided whereby the board may consider and dispose of legitimate complaints involving individuals and employees within the school system. So if anyone is here today and would like to speak, you're welcome to come. Anyone? All right. Well, appreciate everyone attending. And this meeting's adjourned. Uh,